It was the end of August and the skies were cloudless and the weather superb. In two or three weeks I had grown wonderfully fascinated with the curious new country and concluded to put off my return to the States a while. I had grown well accustomed to wearing a damaged slouch hat, blue woolen shirt and pants crammed into boot tops and gloried in the absence of coat, vest, and braces. I felt rowdyish and bully, as the historian Josephus phrases it, in his fine chapter upon the destruction of the temple. It seemed to me that nothing could be so fine and so romantic. I had become an officer of the government, but that was for mere sublimity. The office was a unique sinecure, I had nothing to, nothing to do and no salary. I was private secretary to His Majesty the Secretary, and there was not yet writing enough for two of us. So Johnny K. and I devoted our time to amusement. He was the young son of an Ohio nabob and was out there for recreation. He got it. We had heard a world of talk about the marvelous beauty of Lake Tahoe. And finally, curiosity drove us thither to see it. Three or four members of the brigade had been there and located some timberlands on its shores and stored up a quantity of provisions in their camp. We strapped a couple of blankets on our shoulders and took an ax apiece and started, for we intended to take up wood ranch, to take a wood ranch or so ourselves and become wealthy. We were on foot. The reader will find it advantageous to go horseback. We were told that the distance was 11 miles. We tramped a long time on level ground and then toiled laborlessly, laboriously up a mountain about a thousand miles high and looked over. No lake there. We descended on the other side, crossed the valley and toiled up another mountain three or four thousand miles high, apparently, and looked over again. No lake yet. <laughs> We sat down, tired and perspiring, and hired a couple of Chinamen to curse those people who had beguiled us. Thus refreshed, we presently resumed the march with renewed vigor and determination. We plodded on, two or three hours longer, and at last the lake burst upon us. A noble sheet of blue water lifted 6,300 feet above the level of the sea, and walled in by a rim of snow-cloud mountain peaks snow-clad mountain peaks that towered aloft full 3,000 feet higher still. It was a vast oval, and one would have to use up 80 or 100 good miles in traveling around it. As it lay there with the shadows of the mountains brilliantly photographed upon its still surface, I thought it must surely be the fairest picture the whole earth affords. We found the small skiff belonging to the brigade, boys, and without loss of time set out across a deep bend of the lake toward the landmarks that signified the locality of the camp. I got Johnny to row, not because I mind exertion myself, but because it makes me sick to ride backwards when I am at work. But I steered. A three-mile pull brought us to the camp just as the night fell, and we stepped ashore very tired and wolfishly hungry. In a catch among the rocks we found the provisions and the cooking utensils, and then, all fatigued as I was, I sat down on a boulder and superintended while Johnny gathered wood and cooked supper. Many a man who had gone through what I had would have wanted to rest. It was a delicious supper, hot bread, fried bacon, and black coffee. It was a delicious solitude we were in, too. Three miles away was a sawmill and some workmen, but there were not 15 other human beings throughout the wide circumference of the lake. As the darkness closed down and the stars came out and spangled the great mirror with jewels, we smoked meditatively in the solemn hush and forgot our troubles and our pains. In due time, we spread our blankets in the warm sand between two large boulders and soon fell asleep careless of the procession of ants that passed in through rents in our clothing and explored our persons. 
Nothing could disturb the sleep that fettered us, for it had been fairly earned, and if our consciences had any sins on them, they had to adjourn court for the night anyway. The wind rose just as we were losing consciousness, and we were lulled to sleep by the beating of the surf upon the shore. It is always very cold on that lake shore in the night, but we had plenty of blankets and were warm enough. We never moved a muscle all night, but waked up early dawn in the original positions and got up at once, thoroughly refreshed, free from soreness, and brimful of friskiness. There is no end of wholesome medicine in such an experience. That morning we could have whipped ten such people as we were the day before, <laughs> sick ones at any rate. <laughs> but the world is slow, and people will go to water cures and movement cures and to foreign lands for help. Three months of camp life on Lake Tahoe would restore an Egyptian mummy to his pristine vigor and give him an appetite like an alligator. I do not mean the oldest and driest mummies, of course, but the fresher ones. The air up there, the clouds, is very pure and fine, bracing and delicious. And why shouldn't it be? It is the same the angels breathe. I think that hardly any amount of fatigue can be gathered together that a man cannot sleep off in one night on the sand by its side. Not under a roof, but under the sky. It seldom or never rains there in the summertime. I know a man who went there to die, but he made a failure of it. He was a skeleton when he came and could barely stand. He had no appetite and did nothing but read tracks and reflect on the future. Three months later, he was sleeping out of doors regularly, eating all he could hold three times a day, and chasing game over mountains 3,000 feet high for recreation. And he was a skeleton no longer, but weighed part, <laughs> but weighed part of a ton. This is no fancy sketch, but the truth. His disease was consumption. I confidently commend his experience to other skeletons. I superintended again, and as soon as we had eaten breakfast, we got in the boat and skirted along the lake shore about three miles and disembarked. We liked the appearance of the place, and so we claimed some 300 acres of it and stuck our notices on a tree. It was yellow pine timberland, a dense forest of trees a hundred feet high and from one to five feet through at the butt. It was necessary to fence our property or we could not hold it. That is to say, it was necessary to cut down trees here and there and make them fall in such a way as to form a sort of enclosure with pretty wide gaps in it. We cut down three trees apiece and found it such heartbreaking work that we decided to rest our case on those. If they held the property well and good, if they didn't, let the property spill out through the gaps and go. It was no use to work ourselves to death, merely to save a few ac acres of land. Next day we came back to build, our, build a house, for a house was also necessary in order to hold the property. We decided to build a substantial log house and excite the envy of the brigade boys, but by the time we had cut and trimmed the first log, it seemed unnecessary to be so elaborate, and so we concluded to, to build it of saplings. However, two saplings duly cut and trimmed compelled recognition of the fact that a still modester architecture would satisfy the law. And so we concluded to build a brush house. We've devoted the next day to this work, and we did so much sitting around and discussing that by the middle of the afternoon, we had achieved only a halfway sort of affair, which one of us had to watch while the other cut brush, least it both least if both turned our backs we might not, might not be able to find it again. It had such a strong family resemblance to the surrounding vegetation. But we were satisfied with it. We were landowners now, duly seized and possessed, and within the protection of the law. Therefore we decided to take up our residence on our own domain and enjoy that large sense of independence which only such an experience can bring. Late the next afternoon, after a good long rest, 
we sailed away from the brigade camp with all the provisions and cooking utensils we could carry off. Borrow is the more accurate word. <laughs> that just as the night was falling, we beached the boat at our own landing. Chapter 23 A Happy Life Lake Tahoe and its moods Transparency of the waters A catastrophe Fire, fire A magnificent spectacle Homeless again We take to the lake A storm 